For this last video in the Land of the Bible Old Testament series, we finally reach Jerusalem, the city of the great king. And to make sure that we end the series in style, we've begun with not only helicopter shots, but a time machine. We're here in the Kidron Valley in the 1960s. And behind me there is where the ancient city of David and its Jebusite predecessors existed. That'll be the focus of our attention today. But now, what about the helicopter? Well, from the helicopter we get a view of how Jerusalem is surrounded by higher hills. In this case, the Mount of Olives, with the gash of the Kidron Valley between the Temple Mount and it. And then down here, the Hinnom Valley. Ancient Jerusalem was situated on a ridge surrounded by higher hills. To reach the ancient city by the normal routes you had to climb steeply. And yet, it was looking up at those higher hills where the inhabitants of Jerusalem would see enemy armies when they arrived. This aerial still shot gives a pretty good view of how the ancient city of David stood out from the surrounding ground divided off by these valleys and let you see where the rectangular platform of Herod's temple with its two mosques today stands at the top of that ridge. I've gaily talked about the city of David but looking at the map may help us to understand why the city became David's. When David first became king he was the chief of the tribe of Judah and his little kingdom was based on Hebron and probably controlled the areas in the hills south of Bethlehem. At around the same time the northern tribes probably controlled the area north of Gibeah again in the hill country. Now if we remember that Jerusalem was cut off from the Canaanite cities in the north and that Michmash was at least in Saul's time a Philistine outpost we begin to get an idea of why the area that should have been occupied by the tribe of Benjamin if they hadn't been almost wiped out at the end of the book of Judges was a battleground in this period. It may seem like a non sequitur but bear with me. Jerusalem's water system is really interesting. We enter it from above through a series of large tunnels which lead downwards. Often they appear to have been cut but at times they also seem to have been produced naturally. What it is is clearly human beings having adapted and used pre-existing tunnels which wander through the limestone rock under the city of Jerusalem. These particular tunnels which have a number of shafts which drop off them lead eventually to a shaft which goes down as some of the others do too to pools connected to the Gihon spring. This is a view of Warren's shaft from the top and this is looking up from the bottom. It's possible to drop a bucket down on a rope and collect water from the pool below but when investigating these tunnels archaeologists have more recently discovered foundations for towers which also protected the springs and the pools in time of attack. This suggests a way in which David and his men could have entered the city of Jerusalem climbing up this tunnel system though perhaps having to capture the tower first. The biblical account is more laconic than we'd like and the key word is difficult to translate. But notice how Jerusalem's water system is not the neat man-made tunnel of Megiddo but a much earlier adaptation of existing caves when David captured Jerusalem he seems to have retained many of the Jebusites perhaps in positions of administration or advice. The Israelites had little experience of running kingdoms. We get one sign of this when David wants to build a temple for God in Jerusalem and he purchases a threshing floor, a large flat area at the top of the hill from Arauna, a Jebusite. We get also some indication of how much influence uh, these Jebusites and others had on the developing notions of kingship which are reflected in the Bible in the Psalms particularly perhaps in Psalm 110 which speaks of the king being seated at the God's right hand or God making his enemies his footstool 
which is like King Tut's footstool, had pictures of his enemies on it. This use of pagan ideas can't just be dismissed as paganization of Hebrew religion, because it's precisely these passages that get taken up and used to develop an understanding of the Messiah, the Anointed One, who was to come, and who came in Jesus Christ. Now there's a topic for a, a lengthy conversation. There's another example of Psalms reusing material in some of the Psalms of Zion. For example, Psalm 42 in many ways makes more sense set against the backdrop of Dan in the north and the springs of the Jordan. As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go to meet with God? My tears have been my food, day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving amongst the festive throng. Why, you downcast, O my soul, why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. In this helicopter video we start at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, traditionally believed to be the place where Jesus was buried, and right next door to what's traditionally believed to be Golgotha. The power plays and oppression that marked the story of Israel and marks the story of all human beings reach their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And then we'll see the Temple Mount, the site of some of the conflict in Jesus' last days, with the Mount of Olives in the background. And that's the key message of this series. Out of all the mess of humanity, God brings fulfillment in Jesus Christ. God bless.